This week's episode of Screen Talk is brought to you by Award Season Spotlight. This award season, Time Warner Cable and IndieWire invite you to spend time with some of the year's biggest nominees in our Contender Conversation series. Just go to IndieWire.com and check out the award season spotlight. Each week, we're adding new exclusive video content with the filmmakers and stars behind some of the year's biggest titles. How did Amy director Asif Kapadia make the Oscar-nominated Amy without being an Amy Winehouse fan? How did Simon Kinberg turn a self-published ebook into the Oscar-nominated screenplay for The Martian? And who inspired Pete Docter to make Pixar's Inside Out? You can watch interviews with all of these filmmakers right now. Plus, you can watch all of these nominees and many, many more right from your home with Movies on Demand. Get ready for Oscar night with Time Warner Cable and IndieWire. Welcome to Screen Talk on a very big morning for us. Here we are with actual Oscar nominations to discuss. I'm Eric Cohn, the deputy editor and chief film critic, joined as always by a wide awake Ann Thompson who, who started her day much earlier than we did at the crack of dawn. And, and also Kate Erblin is joining us this week, our managing editor. How you doing, Kate? I'm, I'm still sort of vibrating. I'm very excited. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's an exciting morning. There's just so much to talk about. I mean, we could be here for hours dissecting one issue after another but I just want to start off by saying I'm an optimist I like to look at the good things that happen here because I, I there's so many ways that you can be cynical about the award season and one way or another we have to talk about them I think it's amazing that Mad Max got 10 nominations just a few less than The Revenant a movie that I'm okay with being a big Oscar player I mean Charlotte Rampling first time nominee that's great all for right five years I also love this, the, the, these little touches, like Ex Machina getting a screenplay nomination and A24 doing pretty well with Room, Lenny Abramson getting Best Director, and there's Anomalisa in the animated category. The two best things about Steve Jobs, Kate Winslet, and Michael Fassbender are the only showings for that movie, and Stallone got in. But let's look at the big picture here, which is that maybe there's more of an indie presence than meets the eye, wouldn't you say, Anne? Yeah, no, the thing the thing to realize is that even though, you know, Searchlight got in with Brooklyn and a lot of other great, you know, British films got in um, and, and Room is technically, you know, Irish, if you like. And and uh, the the even the big movies that got in, it, this happens every year where you realize that it's only when an exception is made. Um, and so I want to, I want to, you know, sort of single out the fact that Arnon Milchan at New Regency, you know, a production company paid for The Revenant, $135 million. He took last year's uh, Best Picture winner, but he had already gambled on him before Birdman won everything. I mean, because remember, he was already making uh, this movie uh, during the uh, Oscar campaign last year. And he said, go for it. And he gave... The Revenant, this unbelievable amount of, of freedom that would never have been uh, given to a, a production like that by a studio. And they, of course, they had Leonardo DiCaprio on board and there were reasons why they were Fox, you know, was was distributing the movie, but they didn't pay for it. And, and, and you know, you can also look at the big short, which Paramount did pay for, but it was very much a development from Plan B, Brad Pitt's company, Dee Dee Gardner, uh, you know, these the same people who were behind 12 Years a Slave, so it was New Regency. And, and Selma. Yeah. And they made Selma. And, you know, so you really, you, you, and then the other player is anonymous content, Steve Golan, who actually was behind Spotlight and... Uh, the Revenant, although he was taken off the Revenant in terms of its actual production, but um, and Mary Parent came in, but but he he you know that's pretty <laughs> remarkable too. All so right. Open Road uh, is, is an obvious indie, but uh, I, I would like to suggest that that the Revenant and uh, the Big Short should be considered because they broke the rules. Right. They all broke the rules. So what we're talking about here really is is movies that are we don't see studios make very often, even if they are studio movies in, in the most traditional sense. Of, of and by the, the way, movie. Warner Brothers, which backed Mad Max, Fury Road, but it, it was owned, that property, that, that, that intellectual property was owned by George Miller. And he did it entirely independently in terms of how long it took. What, what, it was on his time schedule. It was up to him. And, so and that movie that is little, all his. And we should talk about that because 
in the Best Director category, there is a noticeable snub, which is Ridley Scott for The Martian, a movie that we weren't sure, was this a big player? Did the studio not believe in it? Yada, yada, yada. Well, it did okay, but Ridley Scott's not there. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that The Martian is weaker than its competitors in some ways. It tells us that the director's branch, which is very tony, very, very snobby, you know, they, they, a lot of foreign directors in that branch, they looked at Ridley Scott, I believe, as a guy who likes to make commercials, as a studio director for hire. Uh, he's not a writer-director. The other ones are all writer-directors on some level. And um, therefore, perhaps in their mind, not so much an auteur. They, they, they respect Inaritu for his artistry, for his bravery. Um, so you're saying the story... Inaritu got the what could have been the Ridley the slot, or is it? Or is it? Did that go to? No, no. I suggest I suggest that Abramson probably Abramson. got it. Yeah. But that means that Ridley Scott was farther down the list than we thought. We thought it was going to be between Miller and Scott for the win, and now I'm just going to give it to Miller right now. So let's look at the bigger picture. Then does this tell us that a different kind of tension is going on here? I mean, what is the real race at this point for Best Picture for Best Director in those big categories? We've got. George Miller, everybody likes him, but that's a that's a just it's, it almost sounds too crazy to believe it. And then you have Inuritu, but there is that narrative of he just won. So does that allow somebody like Tom McCarthy to get even more momentum than we would have assumed in the first place? It's early days, but you have well, come to come on look and at... put your foot down. No, no, I'm going to do it, <laughs> I, and I want you all to argue with me. Spotlight is the movie coming, you know, that was the early front runner that in some ways has already peaked. And it's a small independent like Boyhood was last year with limited support from from all. If you just add up all the categories, it has writers, it has actors, it has directors. Um, and it did get editing, which is a significant thing. That's terribly important that it got editing. But um, you, these other movies are bigger and they have, you know, even more support through the categories and, and I, and they have momentum, big short and revenant both have momentum at the box office. They came out later. They were watched more recently in most cases. And, and they're also sort of showier than spotlight. I love spotlight and I want it to win in many ways, but it doesn't have it. it it's, it's virtues are how restrained and naturalistic and 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 laid back it is, even if it was incredibly hard to make. And I give McCarthy an amazing credit for it. But in the end, the Revenant and and the Big Short are much more bombastic and showy. I love the irony of of you know I'm the guy who who wants something like Mad Max to win, and and you're rooting for Spotlight, but. Uh, Maybe we can I would be rooting around. for Mad Max. I mean, I can tell you right now that on my broadcast film critics ballot, I went, I voted the Mad Max ticket all the way. But I'm, I'm happy if he gets director. I think it'll split, and I think the the winner will be either Spotlight, Big Short, or The Revenant. And in the end, Spotlight and The Big Short are going after the same audience, and that could mean that The Revenant wins. Well, let's throw it to Kate because. She's been looking a lot at the different kinds of indie films that have been cropping up on this list. And even though you can split hairs over how we define these things, one of the, one of the noticeable developments here is that regardless of whether or not certain bigger movies got in, Kate, don't you think that there is a certain kind of domination here by indie films in, in some of the other categories beyond just Best Picture? I think even looking at Best Picture, something that we haven't mentioned is Brooklyn, which is a movie that I love dearly. This is a movie that came out at Sundance. It's people who saw it at Sundance uh, last year, which I actually didn't, and I've been kicking myself for months. Here's a movie that has had uh, like a steady growing affection from a lot of people. It keeps winning people over. People just love it. It's a Sundance movie, and it's in the Best Picture race. And I think that that's something that is absolutely worth highlighting. And I'm not just saying that because I love the movie so much. Yeah, I think it's pretty good. I mean, well, I was surprised that uh, Saoirse Ronan got the momentum that she got, considering the fact that it's, it's, you know, it's just not a movie that had the same sort of visibility 
until much later in the year. I mean, at Sundance, it was it, it wasn't exactly under the radar because it was picked up by a big distributor, but it, it didn't get that kind of uh, you know wave of enthusiasm like say Boyhood did out of Sundance the year prior, and yet. While it might not be vying for Best Picture in a big way, there it is. So that tells us something, that Fox Searchlight is still in the game. Right, Anne? Oh, absolutely. Well, not only that, they know what they're doing. So they maximized, you know, they did an absolutely perfect job. They got Hornby in as well for, for screenplay. And I think Saoirse Ronan is going to give Brie Larson uh, a run for her money. I think it's between those two actresses for Best Actress. And so what do we make of some of these other uh, acting categories? You got Stallone in, in for supporting, which was we thought, well, if Creed gets in, then that'll happen. So that's not the biggest surprise. But there's Tom Hardy for The Revenant. So is Tom Hardy actually a major contender? I, I didn't even, I mean, this was not something we were talking about a lot. No, I, you know, it's funny when I was doing the, um, the the nominations picks yesterday, I mean, I've been saying that he gave an amazing performance, not only in The Revenant, but in Mad Max Fury Road. And you could argue that he contributed to that film's success a great deal, as well as Legend, which was an amazing dual performance from him. So he had a great year and obviously has a lot of respect from the actors. And I'm going to pick him for the win. Also, I think Stallone did not behave well at the Globes. I really so objected that, that, to what to he what did we, there. Is it, we're, this goes back to what we were talking about last week, where you were saying, you know, even though the ballots are already in by the time the Globes happen, it feeds into these campaigns for people who will be nominated. And yeah, he screwed up. He didn't thank his director. He didn't thank his co-star until they went to commercial. So you're saying that was that sort of... On some well, there's also another sort of underlying narrative here, which is which has risen to the surface now, which is uh, I know you were saving this for later, but really Creed is another example where an, a, a, a movie that was created by Ryan Coogler, you know, the person who's getting rewarded is white. OK, right. And this goes back in, to that, that hashtag from last year, Oscars so white. They certainly are this time again. They so. were literally white across all the categories Idris Elba did not get nominated for Beasts of No Nation that movie got no love at all and the Straight Outta Compton which some people thought would get into Best Picture ended up with a screenplay nomination for its four white writers yeah it's it's frustrating to see something like that because it's it's not it's I mean, you cannot just say that it's happenstance there there is a problem with race in Hollywood there is a problem with sexism I mean Look, we're talking about performances in Mad Max. Charlize Theron was, was to me, the real star of that movie. I mean, why, why was that never talked about? I mean, all that had to do with the fact that it's a silent performance. And, people, you know, writers just look, they, they reward words. You know, I mean, this kind it's of, a, and it was a genre be, film. But there has to be I mean, for every, an action film. Every every time that something like this happens, there's an individual rationalization. And it seems like even something like that is indicative of a larger problem. And, you know, whether it's that they're too white or that it's a cer certain kinds of performances that are being rewarded, you know, from different kinds of movies. I mean, it just it just it does feel like there's something kind of old fashioned about these results. Don't forget, Carol completely shut out from Best Picture. And what happened? Best director. And Best Director. We knew we thought that might happen. You, you, were, you suspected that it was losing steam, but that, that's a pretty significant development for a movie that seemed like a pretty significant contender for a long time. This is what I call the steak eaters factor. And that, and the, 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 you know, you know the stats. The, the Academy is overwhelmingly older white males, as is Hollywood itself. And you can get a lot of women in, you know, costume design or or the acting branch is pretty much, you know, split between men and women in a more a relatively equal way. But in the other branches, you know, you really have men dominating everything and they vote for their own. They see the world a certain way. They don't r realize what what they're not seeing. Well, we've been complaining about this for months, but Kate, what do you make of the this sort this sort of turnout? I mean, is is there a is there a flip side to the argument, or are we just kind of stuck with these uh, the, these backwards uh, ways of seeing the industry? I mean, thinking about Creed, I'm happy to see Stallone in there, and I'm happy that he got this push. But 
I've been upset for a long time that Michael B. Jordan never seemed to be in the conversation and that Ryan He Coogler, was so good. He was so good and he really carries that movie and he really like especially looking at, you know, he had Fantastic 4 this year and you watch that and you just you forget about all that bad stuff and you say this is a movie star. To me he's a huge movie star and that he hasn't been in the conversation I find very upsetting. So this is going to go on for a while and, and essentially culminate with Chris Rock's hosting because you couldn't ask for a more extreme perspective on this situation than somebody like Chris Rock. I mean, Ricky Gervais making fun of people in his own simplified way at the Golden Globes is one thing, but Rock may actually turn this into a political statement and he should because this is the yeah the my guess stage. is that he'll agree he's probably contractually obligated to be you know the host of the oscars i don't think he can pull out but he'll certainly go for broke right. at the top of the show he's not he's fun not contractually obligated to only say nice things about the academy that's for sure that's right and he did write a, a, a wonderful piece last year about uh you know just the the nature of, of the the races industry and and you know he was sort of accepting it i mean i it was when um when top five came out he was just saying look i mean it's sort of like being bill murray in lost in translation when you're when you're black and famous you just you, you have your own corner and uh, unfortunately that that is what we're seeing here but uh you know i i do wonder if there is a direct way to solve a problem like this outside of people just talking about it and saying, you know, what the hell we need to think in, in more progressive ways. Because, I, I mean, how, how else can you solve a, an issue of diversity when the, 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 the films that could have been nominated were there? I mean, they were on the table. It wasn't like this was completely, you know, it, it, just, it just so happened that there were only white movies that, that could get into the race. Let's no, they had opportunities. They definitely had opportunities, but there were only eight best pictures. So even if Straight Outta Compton was in the mix for the PGA and came in with 10, you know, out of 10, it, it, it didn't make it. But, and mean, Inside Out didn't make it either. Inside Out's going to win animated. It's fine. Pete Dr. Artie won a friggin' Oscar. Everybody likes that movie. Disney got a ton of nominations all across the board. I don't feel bad for these kind of movies. I feel bad for a movie like Shaun the Sheep because it's so good. Kate's a big fan, too. I so. love Shaun the Sheep. I think it's an instant classic. It delights me. If you, if you want to talk about a good movie from Sundance that gathered some, some momentum, that's, that's a good one to single out as well. I mean, nothing against Inside Out. Or Anomalisa, one of my, another one of my favorite films from last year, actually. And then in the foreign language category, it seems like it's a slam dunk for Son of Saul with Mustang maybe being the upset. It was also nice to see uh, a movie you've been talking up for a while from uh, uh, Colombia, Embrace of the Serpent, which uh, now I have another reason to see. And it also happens to be part of this upcoming Sundance lineup. So uh, that movie is getting a nice little bump from the exposure this morning. And it's also um, for Oscilloscope Laboratories. They haven't had a, a nomination for a number of years. So it's, it's good for that company to be a part of the conversation. But you, you'd say probably Son of Saul has, has got this one. Oh, it's pretty it. safe. I'm sure that'll that'll do fine. And, and on the, in the doc race i mean you can argue with me but i think amy will probably continue to be the front runner in in that race um uh i was uh i was surprised uh with winter fire which i actually thought would get in there at one point but then i decided at the last minute that it might not and i was wrong well so uh, here's what's interesting about the doc race i mean i I was and that's a netflix film also along with the other one the uh what happened, Miss Simone? That is the explanation. I mean, I was at the Cinema Eye Awards last night, and at the after party, you know, just less than 12 hours before the Oscar nominations come out, you ask anybody who's tracking this race closely, and they, they would have said that, the, that there were three films that were a lock, and they are the three films that, that uh, among the, the five that were nominated, Amy, Cartel Land, and... Uh, uh, Look of Silence, thank you, which also won the Cinema Awards last night. So those three being a lock, that left two kind of like wild card slots, and there were many, many possibilities. What about Meru? What about Heart of a Dog? You know, all these so many. Kind of things. But two Netflix films. The two Netflix films in contention got in. What happened, Miss Simone, you know, premiered back at Sundance and was not, you know, universally beloved. People thought it was fine. But... I loved it. I, I thought it was the best of the music docs by far. But 
it's it's this is a campaign that really paid off much as it did for winter on fire a movie that i, I heard i mean i think that's it's a, it's a very well assembled film but i mean i heard a lot of people who were who just thought it was okay i mean these they, they just campaigned. i think really they got well. points for scale on winter on fire uh, winter on fire that's one of the reasons i put it in there i was looking at the movie i wasn't thinking about netflix making a campaign and in no nor was i thinking that way when i picked miss simone i would argue perhaps that that liz garbus as a woman had an advantage in getting in because they of all the branches the doc branch was thinking about that. It became a big debate during the voting pro p p period, you know, that women weren't getting respected enough, even though there are a higher percentage of them in the doc world. Well, I, I mean, it seems to me when you look at a list like that, Amy's the most commercially successful. Uh, it's a music doc, and those tend to do well here, that it would be a lock. By that same token, I wonder if at this point that could even work against a movie like that when you have other movies that are, if not, I wouldn't say edgier, but they have they have more bite to them in terms of their subject matter. And Josh Oppenheimer's been here before with a much more kind of subversive movie. I mean, I thought it was just like the craziest thing that Act of Killing was nominated for an Oscar. But this movie deals with the same subject matter in, in a more accessible way. And if a lot of people actually watch it now, I mean, not many did when it came out in July, but... And say, I'm afraid they're going to think that they've seen it already. And I'm afraid that when you open up the voting to the entire Academy and all five uh, screeners are showing up, which screeners are they going to watch? This is where showbiz trumps seriousness. Seriousness is the element that is involved when the branch is making the final five picks, for sure. And they and Look of Silence is absolutely deserves uh, to be seen, and I hope it is. And if it is, you're right, it could win. But I think chances are it will remain uh, perhaps unseen by many people in the Academy. I hate to say it. If the Academy watch one movie all together, I mean, they're going to watch all kinds of different things and they're going to ignore certain things. Uh, subject matter will scare them off. Uh, actors and directors will scare them off. I really hope that they all tune in to Don Hertzfeld's World of Tomorrow, which was the highlight of last year's Sundance lineup. Uh, he's been nominated before with uh, his, his film Rejected a long time ago, which if anybody has not seen Rejected, Go watch it right now on YouTube. It's a masterpiece in less than 10 minutes. Um, and uh, World of Tomorrow, it's the best thing he's ever done. This delicately made handheld 2D film. It's the ultimate contrast to commercial filmmaking, but it's these sort of categories where something like that could be rewarded because outside of Sanjay's super team, those are all pretty small films in, in, the, in the short film animated category. I can't wait to see. I, I had to make my picks sort of based. I had seen Sanjay, but I hadn't seen the others. I had to make the picks based on the trailer. So I look forward to seeing the, the, the full movies now, uh, and so will everyone else. So let's circle back to, to Best Picture, because this is going to be something we're going to have to really dig through in the weeks to come, even as Sundance takes over our conversation a little bit. And believe me, I can't wait. Um, but I can't wait to escape <laughs> from the awards to go to Sundance, believe me. And, and we'll have so much more to talk about there. But right now we've got eight films, right? And, and you're typing away. Everybody can hear it. Talking I'm about answering Kate's happen. email. <laughs> <laughs> because there's so many things that need to be figured out right now in terms of the next steps. But one of the things that you cannot count out is that the big short was even more of a, of, a, of a false surprise than I think The Martian or Spotlight or Room or even The Revenant, which people didn't really know what to think until they saw it. I mean, it seems like this movie is, is one that gets a lot more consensus than anything else on here. And it, it definitely is going to get some significant support in the weeks to come. No, I, mean, I think it's a three-way race, as I said. I think it's between the big short, which has momentum, Re Revenant, which has momentum, and Spotlight, which is coming out probably off its peak. And therefore, um, and it's a smaller, sort of quieter movie, there, uh, but I'm I'm actually thinking Revenant could be you know beat out the other two uh, because I think they're similar. I think they're very similar. Spotlight and and uh, the Big Short. If you think about it, they're both they're both ensembles. 
and they're both uh, aiming at a political target, and they're both aiming at a sort of brainy uh, viewership. And I just think The Revenant is uh, operating on a whole other level. But more, more um, candidly speaking, what ha- what, which of these movies has the best campaign so far? I mean, Revenant's had a pretty good campaign and been run by Cynthia Swartz, who played a key role in um, getting She crashed. turned the narrative around. That's what she's good at. She knows how to do this. She turned the narrative around so that it was not just how did Inaritu, you know, torture his crew, which he did on some <laughs> level. Um, it's, he tortured it was, his crew. Isn't that it, amazing? <laughs> but it's more, it's more that he's the, the pure artist who fought for his, his vision, you know, and gave Lubeski the opportunity to fight for his vision and gave his actors, you know, this, you know, incredible naturalism in, in, in the environment around them. And then they all get rewarded for combat pay, basically. So what that's, they put, the, that's the narrative. With combat, you yeah. know, with, with credit for what they suffered. Right. Yeah, exactly. But what's the narrative around The Big Short by comparison? You know, nobody suffered to make that movie except all of us who suffered through the housing crisis. So. That's more of a question of a surprise from a major talent like Adam McKay, who's a writer-director, but he's been in comedy. And so we didn't know that he had this in him. Michael Lewis is part of that narrative. They, Michael Lewis is very serious and and a great writer and his movies Moneyball, uh, Blindside, you know, they've, they've all done really well. And, and now you have um, the uh, political crisis that has informed our uh, ec- economy and our world, the 2008 recession, the, the housing market, the whole thing is, is something everybody cares about very deeply. And the actors nailed it, the writers nailed it, the director nailed it. It was, it was extremely well done. All right, well, let's close out with a little bit of wishful thinking because even though there, there are many ways that you can read this race and, and some of them may yield results that we want, there, there are certain things that may or may not happen right now depending on how the next few weeks go. Personally, if I could choose one thing to happen on Oscar night, if I had that power, if Adini said you could choose one category, <laughs> I, would, I would be very particular about it because I, 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 I have faith that Mad Max could win picture or director, so I wouldn't waste my vote on that. I have faith that Son of Saul, both, uh, Anne and I both consider that the best movie released last year. That's going to win for it. I wouldn't waste my vote on that. I think that I would look to the animated category and give it to Anomalisa because that was a movie that was made completely outside of the studio system. Uh, it was a Kickstarter backed thing and I think it would send an amazing message that there is some value in filmmakers like Charlie Kaufman trying you know, at, at, at all costs to do the movie exactly the way they want to do it. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I would single it out if I could make that one pick. And I want to put that hypothetical to you guys as well, because I think it gives us an opportunity to think about, you know, how we're looking at these movies in a slightly different race before we go back to just kind of, you know, looking through Anne's crystal ball, as it were. (laughs) So, Kate, what would be your pick? Kate? (laughs) Well, I actually, so I'm looking over the list and I'm thinking, if I had to pick one, I think I'd go with Best Original Screenplay. And... I, I love Spotlight. Like, there's no denying that. But the only nomination that I actually yelped in my living room when it came up was the original screenplay nomination for Ex Machina. Like, I went, oh! So I think, you know, that's that's my pick. That's where I'd go. And I think that would be fantastic for everyone involved. It'd be great for A24. There, that's me. So cool. Yeah, yeah, totally. I would be on board with that. If I, if I had a second wish, it would probably go to the Ex Machina screenplay. All right, Anne. Your genius. George Miller. It's got to be George Miller. <laughs> but are you picking that? Will you pick that? Or, or do you think that he might I, not win? I think, oh, God, I just feel so strongly about Mad Max and, and everybody involved in that movie it, it, as if it were an independent film, you know, as if it were something where he created this whole world out of nothing, out of, except of his, uh, his imagination. You know, and he made it, you know, the costumes and the, the props and the machines and the, the way that the action swirled in, in this incredibly beautiful and complex way, as well as the actors. Everything came together on that one. But it wasn't, 
it was all coming out of George Miller's brain. That's why I want. I get. I, I'm. I'm actually getting emotional thinking about it. And he also, I'm, I'm he in just, tears <laughs> thinking about this. It, it could be just the uh, sleep deprivation. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking of independent vision, uh, we'll reconvene next week as we adjust to the altitude in Park City to look ahead to the Sundance lineup. And then the following Monday, people who are in Park City, stay tuned for details about the timing for our live screen talk from the Kickstarter Lounge on Main Street, where you can heckle away as, as we talk through the lineup and maybe a little bit of Oscar conversation because, hey, that's not going anywhere anytime soon. But until then, and I'm sure you've got many different things to do as you update your charts, so we'll let you get to it. And thanks for being here, Kate. Thanks, guys. Looking forward to seeing you soon, Anne. We're going to be roomies. <laughs> Stories to come. <laughs>